Uh, thank you for joining us at the end of the hallway here um, in the most important room. And for posterity, uh, it's clear that there are about 4,000 people in the room. You just can't see them behind the camera. So if you're way in the back back there, we'll send a microphone back to you if you want to ask a question. Um, otherwise, you can just get up and shout. But probably we'll be asking most of the people up close to ask a question. Um, my name is Michael Furtick. I'm the CEO and founder of Reputation.com. Uh, the, the topic today is, is the internet for you or against you? And it's a very exciting and broad topic, but we're going to try to narrow it to the, to the concept of data and how data are collected and used, and chiefly personal data, not data about businesses, but data about human beings and how those data are collected uh, with or without permission, with whom they may be shared, how they might be used, how they might be shared on. Is this basically a good thing? Is this basically a bad thing? And as in all things, we are capable of having a very nuanced conversation that is tepid, and instead we are going to try to have a controversial conversation that is exciting, that will, people will want to watch for a long time. I, I am very lucky to be joined by a distinguished uh, panel, and there's also Andrew Keane on the panel. Andrew, that was a joke for you. Thank you very much. Um, and it's a, terrific, it's a terrific group. It's a terrific group. Uh, you may know that I have a particular point of view on this topic, but I'm going to simply stick to the role of moderator and invite what I think will be a very exciting discussion. Uh, we're going to do a couple things differently. We're not going to do intros. I'll do a one-line intro for everybody and get right into it. And we're hoping to make this as interactive as possible. So I would welcome interventions. I'd welcome questions. I'd welcome jokes. Um, and, uh, and simply, the only thing we won't accept is an ad hominem attack, except if it's about me, which I will probably weather if necessary. Andrew, we're going to go straight to you. So Andrew is a, um, is a very exciting person. I, I think of him as the Christopher Hitchens of the internet. Um, and I think he thinks of that as a compliment. Um, Andrew has written uh, extensively on the internet and is sort of your contrary wise contrarian type who writes about the internet. He's the guy who says that the internet has produced bad art, bad culture. He has most recently written a book or published a book called Digital Vertigo, which is about how the social, that he calls something called the social, social media is actually bad and atomizing and fractalizing for people, places, and things uh, in the world. And he is now, I'm, I am uh, privileged to learn, writing a book called the internet is not the answer, uh, which is literally going to be the follow-on in a way to Christopher Hitchens' God is not great. Um, and here he is. Andrew, can you please begin by stirring it up and tell us how, with respect to data in particular, the internet is against you? Thank you, Michael. It's nice to be here. Um, well, the, my other book, the book that just came out, Digital Vertigo, is um, a, a remix. I like to think of it as a remix of Hitchcock's movie, Vertigo which, as I'm sure you all know, is a movie about how someone fell in love with something that didn't really exist, or the blonde woman turned into a brunette. The, the beautiful heiress in San Francisco didn't really exist. And I think the same is true of what's happened on the internet in terms of business models or lack of business models or lack of obvious business models. Uh, what's happened on the internet with all these free services, free products, is that consumers have been tricked. I mean, consumers aren't very smart, and in some ways, I guess, just like Jimmy Stewart in vertigo, they deserve to be tricked. Hmm. Um, but they, they don't have their eyes open. They don't understand the way the world works. So they, I, just saw, I just heard some woman at the main hall say, talk about MOOCs. I, I, I wrote it down, what she said. If I can find my pad. She said, it's this idea that you know, everyone can always have everything. So she, she was talking about these MOOCs, which are the next big thing, which, in other words, the next big disaster. And uh, <laughs> she said, MOOCs is this wonderful thing, anywhere, anytime, at no cost, which is, of course, absurd. It's a lie. I mean, maybe she wasn't consciously lying. But uh, the same is true of all these services on the internet, the Facebooks, the, the, the Google Pluses, and all the rest of it, is that they're, they're free, and they're claiming to represent humanity and service everybody and enable the social and all the rest of it. But actually, they're in the business of acquiring our data and packaging us up. So like in Vertigo, where Jimmy Stewart essentially became the product, when you sit around a table and you don't know uh, who the full person is, it's us. It's all of us. So in terms of all this data, we have become, and again, I wish I'd been the person who said this originally. I don't know who said it. But we are the product. We've been packaged up by all these services. And I think we need to pay for our stuff. I think that the free model is a failure on every level, except for the people who have made a huge fortune from, uh, from these services. Uh, and we need to be much more honest, using, again, the words of Silicon Valley, transparent 
in terms of making sense of this world. Is there anything that in particular worries you apart from kind of low level anxiety or kind of a general sense that it's bad? What, what, what do you think are the outcomes that worry you? Um, I think sort of, th yeah. there was a great book called The Information, uh, which some, you should all read about. Um, and at one the point, Information? Yeah, it's called The Information. Um, uh, it's by a, uh, who, uh, David, who wrote The Information? Uh, I was just trying to remember his name. Um, James Gleck. James Gleck. It's a really good See, book. There you go. There's so James Cham busting out. So good I forgot his nice. name. Um, James Gleck. The Information. G-L-E-I-C-K. And at one Great. point he says, we've become data. <laughs> It's got this whole kind of scientific argument. And I think what I most fear is us becoming data. What I most fear is the idea that humans can be reduced to data and that we can be bought and sold as data. So just as I don't like the idea that we've been unknowingly packaged up as the product and sold as, as uh, to, to these big advertising companies, I also don't like some of these solutions. Maybe some of you will come to it. The idea that we can make money through selling ourselves as data on the network. I think it reduces us, it trivializes us. It, it's, it's a dirty kind of business. I don't want to be reduced to data by data. I don't want to be reduced to data. I don't like the idea of getting money in exchange for data about myself. So your I objection think, is philosophical or aesthetic? My, my, my it's an aesthetic objection. Yeah, my, well, my objection is, is across the board. It's philosophical, <laughs> it's aesthetic, it's economic. Is it political as well? Sense, Are you... and absolutely. It's political in the sense that uh, I think it encourages a culture of rights rather than responsibilities. Although, in a sense, a culture it's, of a, rights. it's a consequence of that. The internet is generating this idea that we all have these rights. It's built around the cult of the consumer. Uh, the idea that you know, all these services exist for the purpose of the consumer, and we don't have responsibilities. And again, I think it's part of the kind of dishonesty of what's going on. People are not acknowledging the way this system works fully. And responsibility is something that I think both companies on the end, big, big data companies, but also users need to understand if we're going to make it a really civil place. It's one of the reasons why the internet is, is lacking civility is because people only have a sense of their own rights rather than responsibility. James, do you have something to say about this? I, James I mean, is the, uh, one of the founding partners of Bloomberg Beta, which is a very exciting new venture fund that has been launched in and through the Bloomberg universe. Um, and, and so I, I think that like uh, much of what Andrew says is right, but it's right in the same way that like the King of England 300 years ago would have complained about like dirty capitalists who are trying to steal money from him and take advantage of the fact that like he naturally owns all the land and that life is much nicer when he's the one who's able to tell everyone cool. that they should be like he should be able to pay, he should be the main patron for Shakespeare and on the one hand I agree that like sort of for the small number of elites who right now have access to lots of data and who really understand themselves and are super enlightened that they have a good time right mm. but I would argue that like sort of what's misunderstood in this line of argument is that you have this chance to expand the pie rap uh, enormously, and there's a great deal of value that's being offered to people all over the world thanks to you know, something like a network, right? And I, well, on the one hand, I would agree that you know, in the same way that the early days of journalism, you know, sort of you think about the rise of journalism in the 19 teens with Pulitzer, these guys were like muckrakers and they were ridiculous and they were gaudy and it was quite embarrassing. That said, you dramatically increased, increased the pie, suddenly a lot of people had access to information, and then maybe 30, 40 years later, everyone becomes respectable, and then they start complaining about television. So you think just watch and wait. You think that the people are getting smarter all the time. They will have more sense of how their data are being collected and used. They will grow up. They will mature. They will become better consumers, uh, contrary to Andrew's prediction. And all of a sudden, there will be a, is that your, is that your general point of view? Uh, so there's, there's, that'll, there's, that'll come to you. Yeah, uh, so I think there's, a, there's sort of like the straightforward market argument, which is that there will be a set of innovators who create new services that some of which will cross the bounds and will end up becoming like sort of over like sort of making a set of bad decisions. At the same time, I'd also argue that we're now at a point where we understand enough of this information economy or whatever you want to call this, that politics now needs to get involved. That they're not, they're, you know, we have a set of like people who like are now well informed enough and understand this basic model well enough 
that we need to make political decisions around sort of where the power sits. So time Syriac? for the regulators. One second. Before, before we get to Syriac, and then I know Dan wants to say something as well. Can you, can you give us an example of, you think, a company that is treating individuals well that is not represented by this panel? And can you give an example of a company that, through its decision to over-invade, over-share, over something, uh, failed? I mean, you know, so you're an investor. You see a lot of deals. You see a lot of companies. Yeah, what are some examples? So I'm reluctant to, you know, sort of certainly the guys on the edge, and, mm -hmm. and and and. But I mean, I think the obvious example is to sort of if you read the Everything Store about the history of Amazon, you see something on both sides, right? On the one side, and within the same organization, within the same department, making a set of decisions that, on the one hand, sort of incredibly enable consumers to have access to goods that they sometimes knew they wanted or didn't know they wanted through, like in one case, a set of emails, right? And on the other hand, making a set of decisions that felt like they overstepped the boundary. And the crazy thing about that is it's not about like someone in an industry. It's literally the same person in an organization making like one, on the one hand, a good decision, on the other hand, a bad decision. And I think those sort of rules need to like sort of be figured out. And they get figured out over time. It's only been 20 years, right? I think that sort of, um, so, so I'm reluctant to talk about, you know, sort of, you look on the edge right now, you look at a lot of early stage startups and you see guys making sets of decisions around sort of trying very, very hard to protect the consumer. Um, I think of like guys like Euclid, who you, you must know, Euclid Elements, um, as they go and they monitor Wi-Fi pings and sort of understand who goes into stores and who goes out of stores. On the, you know, they try very, very hard to protect consumer interests. On the other hand, you have to ask yourself, what if someone else comes in, undercuts them? They're less sap. They're sort of maybe less savory about how they treat the consumer, and will they win? That in was the, the article about Google versus Facebook. Yeah. Google was not willing to sell certain data or give access to certain data, and then Facebook were, uh, were and so the CPM battle began. Syriac, you're the CEO and founder of Shopkick, which is a very successful startup. Um, that is, uh, I'm going to summarize it, then you you correct me. Uh, you are uh, giving consumers very interesting and appealing offers when they go inside stores. Uh, major retail stores based on information that you may know about them and also the stores and targeting offers to them live in the store to give them uh, a kind of a discount a special access to a to a product is that right and then, and can you have having you know, as a guy who collects data has made decisions that may or may not be uh, pro privacy pro consumer can you tell us how you navigate this important line what you what you think is going to be the future okay so uh, first of all yes it's correct what you're saying uh, Shopkick is an app that allows you to uh, see what, which products are hot around you that are interesting at the stores that you know. Um, but it also doesn't only just give you discounts, it also gives you rewards just for being there. So the moment you walk through the door of a Target store or of a Macy's or a Best Buy, you earn rewards. The rewards come in the form of a currency called Kicks. You turn these Kicks into anything you want, like gift cards or movie tickets, coach handbags, whatever your heart desires. Uh, and the more you visit stores, the more you will collect uh, and the more you can redeem. So um, this is the consumer culture that you that Andrew is so yeah. worried about. So right? I want to say a couple of things about this. Yeah. I thought your company was called Vertigo. No, no, it's called the end of the world. <laughs> so uh, so let, me, um, let me make a few statements. Though. First of all, I love that you're, that you're shaking up the panel. I think that's great. Secondly, I fundamentally disagree with your premise. <laughs> and, and I don't disagree for the, I really don't disagree for the sake of Shopkick or the business we're in or whatever we're talking about here. I disagree fundamentally with the premise of not taking consumers seriously. I actually find it ironic that when you say, you know, you are sort of like in the, in the business of pointing out what's wrong with the world, that at the same time, you're actually not taking the people seriously that you're talking about. And that you're saying uh, consumers are pretty dumb. Uh, I think that's what you said earlier. And um, that consumers don't really know what they're doing. I'm not a friend of these lawsuits where a guy drives an RV and then decides to leave the steering wheel and goes to the back of the RV. The RV keeps, keeps driving, you know, obviously. And then the RV crashes and the guy sues the company that there was no sign that he can't leave the driver's seat while he's driving the RV. Uh, and then he gets awarded a million dollars or 10 million or whatever the price was. It's America, sir. Um, yeah, it's or, a legal system you know, here. You're German. Or you he, really goes to, he goes to somewhere and get, takes a hot coffee and spills it over his leg. And, oh, the coffee was hot. I didn't know that. So <laughs> I, 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 funda an old woman. I, I fundamentally believe that was very hot, consumers yeah. are not stupid. 
And I actually believe it is in all of our interest uh, to take consumers seriously because we are all consumers. So if you're saying everyone's uh, consumers are dumb, you're talking to yourself as well. And not just that, I think it's a matter of respect for others. And I actually think consumers are not dumb at all. And the example you can take, uh, there are many examples. Uh, you can take Facebook, the, the company that you probably hate the most, um, when they launched iBeacon. Uh, uh, when they launched Beacon, not iBeacon, that's something. Yes, uh, yes. When, they launched, when they launched Beacon uh, a few years ago, it didn't go down so well with consumers. They knew this was going too far. They didn't want it. They voiced their opinion, and it, it was retracted. And so I think consumers know very well what they're playing. So you and, think, you and, think and you're and actually creating it, a culture of responsibility, I find not it, just a culture of rights, I as Andrew says. I find it patronizing. Patronizing. To yeah. talk down to consumers and say, yeah. you guys don't know what you want. You have no clue what you're doing. In fact, I think people know very well what they're doing. And especially the younger generation that grew up in the digital economy knows very well what they're doing. For example, take Shopkick, right? At Shopkick, we have um, a very strong belief that consumers are the kings and the queens and that no one else rules. And this is not lip service. This is what we believe. This is what we're built on. We would be stupid, by the way, if we didn't believe that. I just want to point that out. This is not a PR thing. You are, you're just plain dumb if you build a consumer company and you think the consumer is not queen or king, then you're just plain stupid because it will backfire. And it's only a matter of time when you please the retailers, when you please the brands uh, in moments of decision making. In most cases, we're trying to create a win-win-win. It's actually working very well. The, con the retailers get foot traffic. The consumers get rewards. They get better deals. And the brands get product engagement. We heard from Jim engagement in everything. People hold up products, literally scan the barcode, they're holding it, they're getting extra rewards for that. So there's a win-win-win. But there are points when you have to make a decision. Do you go left or do you go right? And you can't always please everyone. And in that moment, you have to have your true north. And the true north needs to be, in a consumer company, the consumer. That means, for example... Are there successful consumer companies that you think of on the internet that do not actually have this very enlightened attitude that you clearly have towards consumers? Or do you think all successful entrepreneurs so, in the consumer world also think of entre uh, consumers this way? So I think the question, the question is answered in, um, with this way. Short term, there are a lot of companies that don't respect consumers. Hmm. Long term, there are none of them. Hmm. Because they won't survive. Hmm. It's just a matter of time. You can make a lot of money in a short time by doing bad things. It's mm -hmm. very easy. You know, you, we all know that. There's lots of ways to scam people. Um, and in the long run, this will always come back to you. Life is very fair in the so long run. So let's take a concrete example that may not, may, not, may not be in the service of your opinion. So there are data brokerage companies and data collection companies that have collected data for a long time. And then we'll get to Dan in a second. Uh, and yet they have been very reluctant to show consumers what they know about them. And so I wonder how you integrate this clearly very passionate and well-articulated point of view you have with very successful companies that have been around for 30, 40 years, that are, have huge amounts of data about consumers, that service consumers and give products to consumers, that do not express a willingness to share a, with their consumers what, even what they know about them, won't even give them a copy of the data they right. have about them. How well, do you square that? I, I love that statement. Great. So I completely agree with you that that is, an, um, that, a, that is a problem and it does exist. Mm. And it exists particularly in those industry, industries that need a major shakeup. For example, uh -huh. for example, um, do you love your cable provider? No. Uh, do you like your? Do you Does love it, your? Raise phone? your hand if you do love your cable provider, right? So, <laughs> so no. The, the see answer, the four thousand people in the 4, back. Four thousand. No one in the back, there. but I, but he thinks I'm asking something so, else. Do you love your phone company? Uh, no. Okay, so there we go. Those are the industries that need shakeup. I so, like my phone company. You love your phone company? Really? <laughs> I bet the NSA does too. So in, in, in oh. other words, in <laughs> other words there, yeah. is, there, there are industries that need shakeups where there are monopolistic or, du uh, or, or uh, duopoly structures uh -huh. or oligopoly structures uh -huh. that are not healthy. Mm -hmm. And over time, the only way you can break those up is not, regulation can help because, you know, like, uh, F, you know, uh, anti-merger regulations or whatever, they can help, but they won't fundamentally change the industry structure if the industry is tending to, um, to uh, concentrate over time. So what you do need is innovations that fundamentally break up the story. For example, cable companies have their first competition ever, I think, in 20 or 30 years uh, through IP. 
mm -hmm. first time, right? Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, the IP companies are the phone companies, so that doesn't help too much. <laughs> but there will be another but innovation. But there's other stuff that's happening. There will be yeah. another innovation coming so. that will help break that up. So Personal I completely satellites. agree with you. Those companies, those industries need to be shaken up. Okay, so I love this as a, I love this comment because it's a pro-consumer, pro-entrepreneurship, disrupt everything thing, which is good for the entrepreneurs who are here. Dan, you've been very, very patient. Dan is the partner in charge at Accenture of innovation for Accenture, strategy for Accenture, and travels all around the world and, and, and teaches people how to think about these things. So can Thank you. you. Yeah, I'm, I'm a consultant, so I did a little bit of homework. Uh, I asked um, uh, one of our, I'm afraid I didn't know that much about Shopkick, so I asked about, uh, about Shopkick, and I asked uh, our person who's in charge of, of um, e-commerce, and so he said, oh, I love the application. He says, every time I go to a mall or whatever where there is Shopkick, I go in, I give all my kids uh, the smartphone, and I ask them to take barcode pictures of everything out there, and they come back, and they love it, and it's a great game. So that's how I learned about Shopkick. Um, so Shopkick is as the, as the secondary <laughs> offer. So consumers are smart. Yeah. Of your data yeah, consumers are getting smart and they know how to respond. <laughs> They're accumulating points with his child labor workforce. <laughs> yeah, and I, I wanted to get kid back source. to Andrew. Kid sourcing. I, That's what it is. Kid sourcing. Yeah, no. <laughs> kid sourcing. Okay. Yeah, on Andrew, uh, maybe this is a, a conversation for the bar tonight. But if, if this is what he thinks about consumers, I wonder what he thinks about voters in this country, uh, because it's the same people, uh, and we're letting them vote and democracy is fundamental principles, and then we don't trust them to be on the internet. I'm not sure about that. I asked uh, a friend who uh, runs a company that, that actually has data about what consumers do on the internet, and it's hard to get. This, this company um, sees the social logins that, that people use to get into websites. Um, and they gave me some statistics. They did a survey among their, their users. The company is called Gigia. It's a, it's a Silicon Valley mm -hmm. company. Um, 63%, according to, to them, uh, of consumers believe uh, that companies will sell their data. 52% of consumers believe that they will send spam to them. And a fairly high number believe that they also post on their Facebook sites if they log in with Facebook. Also, they have noticed uh, for e-commerce sites mm -hmm. a 3% decline mm -hmm. in registrations for every permission extra permission that consumers are asked. That tells you... So permission to send you something, yeah, permission yeah. to share something. Consumers are careful. Uh, another anecdote there that's, that's more one data point, but companies that agreed not to do those things saw a 300% increase in conversions. Because companies consumers... Companies that do not require permissions exactly. get higher conversion rate the, through the funnel. Took the permissions off the yes. website. Yeah. And... Um, they saw a huge lift in terms of their engagement with consumers. Then the attorney general comes back and says, you have to put the permissions yeah. back in. Oh, you put it, like in Europe, I think 20 years too late, they put in this thing. This site sends cookies out. Right. I mean, it took 10 years to figure that out. I mean, who cares? But um, so, well, well, what's known is it who cares or what can you do about it? Well, so, exactly. So in other exactly. words, People are consumers know. sort of... Res well, so I wonder, is it, is it that consumers know or do they think... I got no choice. Like, what's the what's the what's the conclusion? What's the correct conclusion? Well, if you look at this if data, if I want to read the Financial Times, I have to accept the cookies. Like, what? Yeah. What's the correct conclusion? Well, if you look at this data, it looks like consumers are learning very quickly and they're pretty smart about what they want to divulge, to whom they want to divulge it, and when they want to agree to a relationship that mm -hmm. involves sharing data. And as as you said, we're early. It's early, James. Uh, in ten years, I think our young people will know the ones that become. Kids now will know exactly what ha what's happening with the data. So it's an important. So question. it's a transitionary issue. It's yeah, a very important ahead. question. Andrew set it up in a lot of ways as he did, and then can Syriac I just, and Dan. Can I defend myself here? So, so <laughs> can, can I, I want, may, I, may I set you up to defend yourself? Maybe. So the the, the the question is, you said consumers are dumb, and and did I actually it, say that? Well, could, Andrew says things very strongly, but let's not fully dismiss yet. Andrew's you said they're point not smart. I wrote it down. Let, let's let's not dismiss Andrew's point of view just yet. Let's say consumers learn fast, but the internet perhaps moves faster than consumers. Consumers can learn. So let's say the consumers are perhaps learning a lesson of five or ten years ago now, but the internet is accelerating at two years for every one year of time in terms of innovation and data collection. Is that a fair fight? Right. Is that a fair fight? So even if we believe the consumers are smart over time, I'm an optimist, I believe that, um, is it a fair fight? Is there something else that needs to happen, whether in politics, as per James, or something else? Andrew, or do you want to defend yourself more well, I did vociferously want to just clarify. Maybe, I, maybe, I, I, my, maybe I oversimplified. Um, what it meant was that um, 
I didn't say I didn't like people, and I didn't say people are stupid. I said uh, that one of, one of my problems, one of my critiques of the internet is that it presents people exclusively as consumers. And actually, I would contrast a consumer with a citizen. And it comes back to your question about politics. I don't think that the internet is seasoning people for citizenship. It's turning all of us exclusively into consumers in the sense that all we think about, apparently, is you know, going into stores and giving our six-year-old smartphones so that they can click on, on a dress so we get a discount. I'm not going to give you know, if, if that's what you want, fine. Uh, so what's the alternative? So, but, but coming back, okay, what's a, what's the alternative? coming back what's the to this the whole issue of whether people get what's happening on the internet, I would, I would, uh, I don't think they do. I mean, mm. how many people actually read the terms of service? I think LinkedIn is one of the better companies. It's one of the companies I trust more. I actually consider Reid Hoffman a kind of friend. But on the other hand, um, LinkedIn knows so much about me that every suggestion of someone I should contact with, are, these are people that I, I'd forgotten I even knew 30 <laughs> years ago. How does LinkedIn know so much about me? Probably because I haven't read the terms of service carefully enough to click in some sort of box so that they don't access my email. Uh, Facebook is another good example. Google, I mean, Syriac talks about the internet as if it's this democratizing force. Look at Google. It's much more of a monopolist, much richer, much more but powerful. So what about LinkedIn? What, what, well, so but, what's but, the big but, downside but, but, if they know who you should connect with? Why is that bad for you? Why is that bad for the people? I don't want a service that knows, it seems to know more about me than I know myself. But let me just come to Google. Mm. Okay. Uh, if That's interesting. consumers use Google all the time, right? This is the dominant company, 80% of the search market in Southern Europe and so on, much more of a monopolist than telecom companies or big media companies or, or, or Hollywood or anyone like that. Um, and Google is cleverly connecting all its services, uh, encouraging, pushing its users to become, to, to have accounts on Google so that it knows more and more about us. Mm -hmm. uh, Google is the quintessential company here in terms of driving this new economy. Uh, and I don't think, and I, I, I really strongly believe this, that I, I think that a very small minority of consumers understand what Google is doing. I, I think the same is true of Facebook. I'd be interested to see what David says about the typical Facebook user. Do they read the terms of service? Do they understand the way their data is being used? I don't think it's true. I think consumers, for the most part, and I include myself, are lazy when it comes to reading these terms of service. And these companies are really smart. So in a way, it's a kind of question of fairness and distribution of power. It's a very deeply important political statement, whether we agree with it or not. David and then Stephen. Oh, we're going to do it, Mike. OK, there's a mic around here. So in the front row of the 400,000 rows that we have. This thing is on. So uh, I don't know whether Facebook users know that, but I think Dan's statistics are fascinating because they imply you don't really need to read the terms of service to have a pretty generally good idea about what's going on. And I would say my impression is people are realistic. They know they're getting something for free and they're giving something away in exchange because otherwise it wouldn't exist. I mean, that's just common sense. And, and I, I, this is something I, I, I don't want to, I mean, it'd be very easy to obsess on all of Andrew's extreme statements, and I, it's a great <laughs> panel, and I don't want to do that, but I have to just ask you, you know, given that you said that you absolutely, that the notion of selling your personal information seems to turn your stomach, um, would you prefer that Facebook, Google, Twitter, LinkedIn, I could list 15 more, don't exist at all? Because basically, in order for them to exist, that is what you're doing. I would prefer they charge for their services. Well, so then you, you don't, would, you, I assume you use those services. You use Google, right? I mean, you are. Yeah, but are, I don't have a Google account. Yeah, but you know what? They're still targeting you with advertising. That's a sale that you're making. If it's not cash, it's, it's usage in exchange I for your data. I would personally, and I, I, you know, I'm a typical consumer in, in the sense that I do use Google. I'm not on Facebook. I'm not on most of the networks. Uh, I personally would rather pay to use Google. So let's go to I Steve. would rather, you know, you pay whatever it is, $10 a year, $5 a month, to have access to a service that, that's very useful, very helpful, that I use all the time, but that doesn't have the advertising strings. Steve? I, I think one of the great ways Steve, to have one, this... one line on yourself, would you just So say? Steven Sprague Wave Systems have been chasing the aspects of DRM and trusted computing for 20 years. Great. Um, so, so I think one of the huge challenges is to apply this in real concept to children. 
and I think it provides a clarity of thought. If your child goes to the hardware store and steals a hammer and, and is caught shoplifting and reported to the police, we have the concept of a sealed record. I think it is our obligation. It's not, it's, it's really at a very substantial level, our obligation to protect our children. It's one of our fundamental things we should do. Ultimately, the ideal solution would be that everything, emphasis on the word everything, typed into Facebook by someone under 18 should be encrypted in a manner that they can revert to a policy control that's mom and me. And so the idea that we can replace the Kodak collection in the basement. So I um, happened to meet my wife when I was 16. And the other day we were cleaning out the basement we discovered the most evil thing you can possibly find, which is letters we wrote back and forth to each other when we were 16. You do not want to give these to the children yet. They're not old enough for this content. Um, and, and the point is, is it was safe. Right. Right? It was in the basement and it was safe. And so how do we create that? How do we create an environment where my 15-year-old daughter can be on Facebook and you know what? They're not educated, their brains aren't developed enough, they don't understand the bits and pieces of it, and so regulatory-wise, one could support that. It's different than the right to be forgotten, which is the current European Union's lunatic concept, which is to take that shoebox of all those mementos, and when you go to college, have a ceremony in the backyard and burn them. Put that on Facebook, put that as a video on YouTube, burning your childhood mementos, because that's evil. That's in the fundamental concept of it. And so I think we need to provide the tools. I think it's the obligation the of a company like- Is Snapchat an example of that tool? So uh, I is, think Snapchat- Is technology gonna provide a solution to this problem that you're- Snapchat posting? with an independent key server. You cannot combine the data store and the keys in the same company. Okay, so because Snapchat, then it's discoverable. Here, Snapchat is, is, is very popular with the kids, we'll come to you in a second, very popular with the kids, and you send a picture of yourself or something, and you send it to the other guy, and, the, and your friends re look at the picture, and then it expi expires. It locks up. So, you can't, so it's not on the server anymore. So it's kind of an ephemeral communication tool. And Just build Snapchat yeah. with the keys for a French child in France. So that even though the data is stored in California, it's not subject to the Patriot Act. It's subject to whatever the rules and regulations are of protecting a server in France, which is the country where the children reside and the parents thought it was appropriate to sign up as a server. Very quickly back there to you, Andrew. There are tools to do that. Okay, very quickly back to you, Andrew. Um, are you hopeful because of things like, and then we're gonna go to you for a question or a comment. Are you hopeful, is to Snapchat and the advent of the technologies like Snapchat make you hopeful that, that data will re repose in more in the control of the, con the end user, the consumer, the citizen? Or is this not something that is uh, giving you hope? Very quickly. I'm hopeful about Snapchat, although, you know, you can argue it the other way as well. I mean, according to my kids, anyway, Snapchat's mainly used for teenage pornography. Sexting. Uh, okay, go back after the, no, please, the question. Wait, wait for the microphone, because we're going to, this is for posterity. We Jody remember Westby, you. Global Cyber Risk. Um, I, I would prefer to think that companies are dumb versus consumers are dumb. And so if we take um, Apple, for example, Apple understood the consumer. Apple soared beyond Microsoft, blew everybody off the chart because they started giving customer service. They cared about everybody that bought their product. They cared if the consumer <laughs> liked their product. Look at Amazon. Well, can you say the same thing about Exxon, which is the biggest market cap company in the world? I mean, do they care deeply about you at the gas, like at the gas pump? I mean, and so if you look at Amazon, Amazon also is a company that's a great example of building its business model around the consumer, versus companies. Then if you categorize companies, so uh, the data mining companies, they're not consumer companies. They're, they're business companies, to business maybe. companies. So cat, put them in the right category, so we don't mix this up. Okay. But the consumer will learn. And that curve, I think, is directly proportional to two things, legal frameworks and enforcement. Mm. And when they start understanding the laws that protect them, and they start understanding that there are enforcement authorities out there, which are taking off at a galloping pace now, that the learning curve for consumers is going to go up very fast. And the impact on the companies that are dumb is going to be is great. the learning curve for the consumer going to go up? Are they going to have to? Are they going to be? Are they going to be okay 
and justified being okay and not having to think about this more often because in someone who's an expert in enforcement will be thinking about it in their behalf. Right, a darker, a darker view which of way, it, yeah. which I think is like maybe another way to think about it is it's not so much that the consumers are getting smarter, but rather the political forces and regulatory forces are getting smarter because they recognize that this is a fundamental threat to their power, right? And that like on their side, they have to get savvy because they now realize that there's a great deal of both economic power and sort of attention on the part of most consumers and most citizens that's going to go towards these set of services. And as a result of that, they're going to want to exert some power. Before we leave her, is this, are we seeing an arc that we've already seen with financial institutions that were, became very re heavily regulated, with telcos that became very heavily regulated? Telcos used to have a lot more freedom, and then they became very he heavily regulated as to what they could do with the data about your phone calls and records. Um, and is this now the moment where we can have peace of mind because that may happen to the internet as well? Well, what we're seeing is, uh, I think, increased enforcement authority. We're also seeing increased um, action on beefing up privacy. So the European Union is still leading the charge in that. The European Committee in the European Parliament has just approved um, an enhanced data protection directive yes. that would offer a lot more protections. So at the U.S. level, we have some languishing initiatives at the White House, but they're trying to move toward the EU role. So they're seeing a lot more in the news about lawmakers becoming a lot more savvy around the world about um, uh, privacy rights. You're seeing people in developing countries starting to understand privacy rights. Mm. And so this evolving global framework is doing a lot to educate the consumer. And it's doing a lot to also then fund government initiatives for enforcement. And the, and the fines for enforcement are becoming serious. So let's just take HIPAA. Some omnibus rule just came into a compliance quickly deadline HIPAA. Yeah, September quickly. 23. Yep. The maximum penalty is 1.5 million from like 50,000. It's a big jump. Yeah. It's a big jump. And yeah. so it's a big jump in enforcement, and people pay attention to that. Thank you very much. Thank you for that very interesting kind of comments. We'll go to Syriac in a second. Um, Dan, you and I have seen, you have a very global perspective on this. You and I have seen, I think we watched a movie over a period of three years at the World Economic Forum about how personal data may or may not get used, and it's a slow-moving bus. But one thing that I think I observed was that the FIs, the telcos, the uh, ISPs, the healthcare companies that have a huge amount of data but are regulated from using those data in a way that the internet media companies are not, started to wake up to the idea that there was a huge wealth creation opportunity if they could somehow be pro-privacy or pro-consumer, perhaps, and yet then and therefore be able to mine and use those data. Do you think that that is a trend that is correctly observed, or do you think I'm overstating it? Or what have you observed that might be in that parking lot? Uh, it's clear that some companies have more trust than others. And, in, and, and actually, in Europe, some of the telecom companies, as opposed to the US, have um, decided that they want to leverage that. Um, it's much more complicated, though, because um, the internet is moving so much faster than they can right. in terms of their business models. I think the, the idea that regulation lags reality uh, in the marketplace is correct. I think we see that in that situation because the World Economic Forum and the regulators in Brussels have been working on that in six to eight years. And frankly, I think that's OK, okay. Uh, because um, we don't want to slow progress. And I think the regulators in, in Europe are understanding that too much. And we want to let the internet grow through experimentation. Mm -hmm. We heard yesterday a presentation about a company that has unbelievable personal data, which is the greeting card company or paperless post. They know when people get married, when they have birthdays, et cetera. We want these companies to be able to survive and succeed and create and add value. If they were regulated with the heft of the regulations that are being envisaged in Brussels, I think it would be very hard for them. Uh -huh. So I think uh, the issue with the, the incumbents, I think David talks about that a lot, is they cannot execute that well in the speed uh, at which that kind of thing is required. It's not necessarily that the regulation is slowing them down. Mm. And so we need to see more innovation. Uh -huh. um, and maybe the incumbent companies that have the brand and the trust buy the innovators and create those businesses. But for the time being, it's fairly slow. Syriac, you wanted to come in, and maybe on this point or another point, can you come in? Yeah. So I think um, I wanted to I wanted to add something to the conversation you started. I think there there is definitely whenever you create something really new like the internet, um, uh, something powerful like the internet, you're creating problems with it. 
there's no doubt that there are issues. And you're, you're completely right by pointing out, from my perspective, completely right pointing out certain problems that come along with it. Um, and I think that's really fair and it's actually good for someone to point it out because otherwise we might just be sort of like blindly following the trend. And I think that's really good. It's helpful. But I think it's true for any new thing that comes along. Uh, when you um, go from, um, you know, from, a, from a horse to a car, people die in car accidents. Uh, and when you go from um, uh, cash only uh, to credit cards, you go to fraud. There's all kinds of things that are, whenever they get invented, they produce positive effects and negative effects. Mm. In the long run, uh, things will usually figure out themselves whether the benefit is greater than the cost. And if the benefit is greater than the cost, then over the long run, this will stay. And if it's not, it will go away. Let's the question is, how long does it take to, uh, for, for that process? And who gets hurt in the meantime? And regulation is required for that. For example, you pointed out, you know, like if, if we only produced uh, fun for the kids at Shopcake, we would go away. Hmm. So we have to produce $500 million in revenue a year for our partners now after four years. And we have to produce 30 to 60% incremental revenues per user who's using Shopcake. If we don't, we're gone. And that's fair. Mm -hmm. So in other words, things have to... Uh, have to pan out over time and it's good to have a warning signal from somewhere what I don't agree with is the conclusion how we should change it quickly before we get to Andrew um, is there can you give us without revealing anything that's too secret about your company is there a moment uh, at, at, that you can recall for us that it very concretely puts some meat on the bones of this discussion where you decided to do X that would be uh, give consumers control of their data versus Y is there a choice you made not to do something a certain way about consumers' data and their relationship with their own data that you can tell us to concretize this for our, for our discussion? I remember very well the very first retailer we were trying to get on board, um, and the, or the first retailers, the first one ever was Best Buy, and we were build, building an alliance, right? Uh, we were basically saying, hey, you can earn kicks everywhere at multiple retailers, uh, and it will be great because with an alliance, everybody benefits. The more power because of the combined consumer power. And then the question, of course, that came back was, well, who else is in the alliance? Well, unfortunately, right now, it's just you. Uh, but <laughs> there will be others. There will be others. Uh, and so in that moment, conversations obviously also began of, you know, who owns the data? Uh -huh. uh, and when somebody walks into a store, that's really powerful. It's, very, it's great information. Uh, and the question was not asked because they, they wanted to misuse any of it. Uh, it was asked because they thought it could be very useful. And that's true for almost any retailer we talk to. Of course, that's the first question. Do I own the consumer data? Do I know who's walking in? And the answer is no, you won't. And the answer is no, because if we disclose that, the consumer wouldn't know that. And they wouldn't, um, they wouldn't understand why. They wouldn't get an immediate benefit from it. So there is, there is a, a, going to be a perception of a lack of respect, which breaks one of the fundamental rules, I think, of data usage, which is respect. Uh, it's a golden rule, how you want to be treated. Uh, how I want to be treated, I should treat you. Okay. Uh, and then the other thing is there's no immediate value, so I can't really deliver that either. So the answer is no. However, and this is very interesting, because mm -hmm. it, points out, it points out when it can be useful. Mm -hmm. If you were to, lo to log in with your loyalty program number from that store, and link your loyalty card from that store in our Shopkick app, which we hadn't done yet, but we might do it one day, then, of course, it's totally fine to share the data. Because right. right. you've already signed up for that program. Right. You want them to have data in return for whatever they offer you. So there's a very clear choice here. And I think it's a very clear red line. That's very you can always ask yourself, would I want that? That's very interesting. And the answer is no, you can't do it. Andrew, you wanted to say something. And then yeah, I, I think uh, something, yeah. I, one of the reasons I actually like this event, David's event, is because it, it treats what's happening in, in digital society, Ericsson do the same thing, as a, as a major moment in, in history. This is equivalent to the Industrial Revolution in, in most respects. It's the, mm. new, it's the new thing that's changing everything. And I think this idea, well, we've been through it before, we don't know what to expect, is, is wrong. We need to, and I, and I do this in my book, A Digital Vertigo, we need to think historically. We need to understand that what's happening now is as traumatic and profound and destabilizing, and also in, in some ways very positive, as the Industrial Revolution. And the only way the Industrial Revolution worked out is because it was regulated. The only way it worked out is because 
uh, government was strong and they understood that you needed to respect labor laws and all the rest of it. Uh, data issue is the, is, is the 21st century version of environmentalism. Um, but the... Right, but, but the problem with this is that bound up in the internet, and I think Stuart Brand is a perfect example of this, is a kind of a, and, and this comes out of the hippie ethic, is a left libertarianism that re rejects authority, rejects government. And so the internet, as Brand and Markov and everybody else understands, was created by people who rejected the idea of authority. It's all edge and no center. So the problem now in a world in which is kind of spinning in some senses out of control is just when we need regulation, just when we need some adults to control what's happening, the government is increasingly undermined. People don't trust authority. Politicians are, are disrespected. So that's the challenge of how to reinvent authority and government in a world which seems to be controlled by the edge rather than the center. Very interesting statement. Patty. Um, I'm calling on you, and it's unsolicited and unexpected. So you can just say, you know, pass if you want to. But Patty, you run a conference for founders of companies. And I'm, what occurs to me is you see a lot of, therefore, founders of a lot of different kinds of companies, both in North America and in Europe chiefly, is what I understand. Are you seeing any entrepreneurs or a growing number of entrepreneurs who are interested in giving consumers more control over their data? Or are you not seeing any any growth in that set of entrepreneurs? And there's a microphone right behind you. And you can also say, I don't want to talk about this. Is it a phone a friend? Um, no. Phone um, a friend. <laughs> Lifeline, right. Um, I, so many of these issues are sometimes binary, quite black and white. And I, I think in issues of data protection, of which Europe would diverge quite strongly to kind of sentiments or at least the philosophical views of America. Um, I feel entrepreneurs, by and large, those I've interacted with, um, I'm not really too sure, I'm not positive if they respect consumers or don't respect consumers. I just think it's a, it's a spectrum and it's a, it's a constant battle if seizing more information um, from the hands of consumers helps your company grow, mm. then you'll optimize for that outcome. Um, and that's just a consequence of the type of business that, you, that, that you're building. Um, I think traditionally throughout history, large businesses that have had an interest in accumulating knowledge or information on their users or their customers or their consumers will continue to do so and become more aggressive in the pursuit of that and uh, until they're regulated. It's a kind of natural evolution of any large institution that's established for the, eventually for the purposes of accumulating ever more de data. And if you look at Facebook and all the other competitors that were emerging at that time, they all optimized for grabbing as much information about people's friends as possible to increase the speed at which their graphs expanded. Yeah, can I jump in? Okay, yes, so to back to James. Thank I mean, you I think, that, Patty. I, I think Patty's exactly right that, you know, sort of we forget in startups the desperate search for attention and the desperate search to find a business model for someone to actually pay you, right? And I think, like, in that desperate search, like, you know, entrepreneurs are going to make sets of decisions, a lot of which, you know, sort of will be illegal probably five years from now. Right? I think like that's relatively clear. Will that end up basically helping and, and calcifying the success of the incumbents? I, I, yeah. I, uh, will that, will that, that's a question. I mean, so like, I think that if I mean, you, you read, get escape it, philosophy it, if you're you know, Facebook, but then right. the other so guy think, can't compete I think with a you. bunch of guys read Tim Wu's book about empire building, right? And I think a lot of folks read it and they said, oh my God, this is terrible. And then a lot of entrepreneurs read it and they said, oh my God, awesome. this is why I should be <laughs> spending money in Washington, D.C. And literally true that people increased their budgets in Washington, D.C. because they realized that regulation was a way to like sort of preserve like the status, their current yeah. status quo. This is the big battle I've had with the FTC. It's that they, they thought that they were, um, uh, it's not a battle, I've just been trying to communicate to the FTC that, that, that though their enforcement actions were very brave in a lot of ways, it also had the unintended consequences of 
sealing the door behind the incumbents and giving them the way to win. Right. Yes, and, please. I'm sorry, but just, and the generalized observation as far as like startups who are trying to think about this seriously, I'd say that right now in, there are very, very few. And I'm, I mean, I've looked quite hard for companies that think about the world that way. And in general... Which way, specifically? Thinking, thinking about sort of either creating new products that actually protect and think about consumer data in a way that they can actually protect it or create new products that they might find interesting. Sure. And in general, to be honest, there, I, I've invested going a couple, way. and but the ones that I've seen are typically idealistic think tank products, yep. or they're very, very scummy. Very, right? you know, <laughs> they're very scummy. Yes, please. Who are Michael Smolens, not sub. Do, do you find any of the panelists a difference between anonymous, like RTB, real-time buying, uh, in terms of advertising revenue is probably yep. the largest source of revenue that people are desperately looking to get. Yep. And if you want to serve up an ad to someone who bought, who looked at a pair of shoes and this, but you don't know she's Mary Smith, uh -huh. but you're just serving it up an ad to an anonymous person who has a certain amount of demographic thing, is there is that a violation? Where does that fall in the spectrum of violating someone's privacy? But you, you don't know their name, rank, and serial number, but you know they're a consumer who has certain characteristics. Do you see a difference in that as opposed to other kinds of sort of violations of privacy? Dan, can you help maybe frame the question a little more broadly and say, what, are, there any, are there any orientation points that people that seem to be emerging in the discussion here as to what the, what the red lines might be? Yeah, I think, you know, we talked a lot about this asymmetry, um, that companies know a lot more about you than you know about them, and you know about how they use the data. So the questions, the way I think about it is, is where is fairness intersecting with this asymmetry? And it's a question of time and education. I think um, the younger consumers understand very well the economic exchange that's going on. Less experienced consumers are not as experienced. Uh, and not don't understand that exchange and are surprised. You know, I browsed for a car three days ago, and now I see an ad for a car. Kids understand, and many kids understand that uh, because in many cases we're actually trying to teach them that. Um, so again, it's I think it's a it's a it's a timing issue. Uh, I think over time we'll understand that. What what worries me a little bit is um, something that we don't talk about that much is the trade in intention. Um, the ads are, you know, if you see an ad or don't see an ad, that's interesting. But there's now a, a whole industry, which we don't talk about that much, that sells very accurate intention data. They will say, this person is going to buy a car in three months. This person is interested to the Kaplan um, group here in secondary education. We have tracked them over the internet. We know that they'll probably sign up for a paid university degree or something like that. Uh, and that is beyond, I think, what consumers know that is being sold and traded. And that's not $2 a transaction. That can be hundreds of dollars. Yeah, hundreds. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, is something that where um, there's not enough transparency. So in terms of kind of the goalpost, that, while I think some of the basic things we've had enough time to understand and educate, some of these more sophisticated things, and the billions of dollars in R&D are going towards this intention market, maybe hundreds of millions, I may be exaggerating, but a lot of money, that is something we don't quite understand. And that's where I, you know, I would tend to agree this with is Andrew. The, this, is the, this is right here, the nexus of the debate right now. But if this I'm is not, but it's, it's, not, it's not some obscure company. You know, five years ago, Eric Schmidt gave an interview to the FT, and they asked him, where do you want Google to be in the future in, uh, in five years? And, and, and Schmidt said, I want us to know our users so well that we'll know what they'll want to do and will know what jobs they want more than they yeah. know themselves. So yeah. this is not some obscure, slimy little data company somewhere. These are the big companies who are getting into the intentionality business. Big billions of dollars of investment. And we're going to work down the chain in a second. And the critical thing, Sandy Pendle at MIT has shown, as others have shown, that you can, you can tell where people are going to be in 20 minutes with a high degree of consistency yeah. and reliability very frequently during the week. Um, so I, I, the question remains, can consumers keep up with the pace of change? So Google Glass is now on the street. Soon you will be understood as the person who has been viewed through the Google Glass. Then they will be able to track your weight over time. And then those data will end up in the, in the hands of some insurance company who will decide whether you're getting fatter or thinner over time and how close you are to McDonald's every week. And that, that is not something I think a consumer today expects to happen. It sounds like sci-fi, but we're very close to it. David, can I j jump, jump the queue and go to this fellow who hasn't spoken yet? Hi, I'm Jim Grove with Cisco. Um, I've been studying a lot about this, the Internet of Things, and thinking about the data, the data issues, and everything. 
And um, there's a couple of things. W one, I tend to agree with you about that the market will settle where where people do the right thing. I think when we do the right thing and we give the consumer something back, I think of Mint. Mint is non-intrusive because they give me this great picture of my finances and they tell me when I'm spending too much money on my credit card that I'm using, for Who here example. uses Mint? Right. Who here uses Mint, who used to use Mint and no longer does? That's interesting, that's the trend I'm seeing. I think some people just don't yeah. use it anymore. I but why. I, I, my, I, one of the things I think that there's an opportunity for here, and I, I, was at a, I was speaking at another conference when we were talking about big data, and I was in one of these sessions like this, and people were talking about how even within their own companies, the data that they're collecting, they're not even sharing because the data equals power, right? And I, I also was really just That's recently great. reading about uh, dark pools and what's been happening in high frequency trading and realizing that there's incredible, incredible value in the data. And there's going to be, as we instrument the rest of the world that's not instrumented yet, there's, this, this is going to become even much more of a problem. I mean, because, because we're going to instrument everything. And so I think of myself as a consumer and I say, how come Ford gets the data from my car? How come I don't get that data and get to choose who gets that data? How come I don't get a chance to choose? Maybe United wants to pay me to learn about my American flights. How come I don't get to monetize that data myself? And I think Hooray. there is a huge opportunity to build an exchange for data that companies will trade, that people will trade, that could be... 10 times bigger than the amount of transactions and finance and that happens even in our, in our current, in our stock markets and currency and futures and, and all that kind of stuff. Anyway. That's great. Anyone else who, who hasn't gone yet? And then we'll go back to the people who have. Is that down the end? And Mark Davis talks about, Microsoft talks about data banks, which is another really interesting area. So I'm, I wanted to come back to Andrew because I'm, I, I want to tease out kind of where the line is. Because database marketing, right, you think Experian, Equifax, these guys, it's been going on for a long time. And long time. A lot of things like, are you going to get a new... I'm sorry? Who are you? Just I'm sorry, Darren Clark, CTO at YP. YP, right. Yeah. Um, so where, where's, the, where's the line? Because we, you know, we've, you always hear like, where's the spooky factor start? And I'm curious, especially with, with Andrew, because I don't know that it's inherently as moral as you're making it out to be, and it's just technology and, you know, new behaviors arise out of that. But could you draw, like, the line, like, where, where does it step over kind of into the, the dark realm that you're, you're worried about us cascading into? Well, just to come back to Michael's point about Google Glass, I think that if, if, if Google Glass and Google self-driving cars catch on, I think those both cross the line. I don't want a company that knows everything that I'm looking at or where I'm driving. I'm already uncomfortable enough with Google. As I said, I, I use it, but I don't sign in. So I would say Google Glass and self-driving cars. And it doesn't mean that you can't have self-driving cars. We did a whole thing at Futurecast. I think it's a really interesting area. But again, this whole issue of data is central to it. And the guy, the car company guy earlier was talking about it. I mean, they have to resolve it. You can't build all these products and companies around the exploitation of the user's data. I, I think the key here is transparency. The consumer needs to know what's going on in order to be able to make a, a judgment call. But so, more, you mean real more, transparency beyond terms and conditions transparency? No, no, no. Right? I'm talking about real transparency. Okay, so what does like, that actually look like, like in the field? Like simplicity, like for example, that when I know I'm using a self-driving car, I have a very clear sense this data goes there and it's being used for that. And simple to understand, it's not in the fine print. I should be able to log into Google and see what they have. See That's my data. Right. You can. So, so here's, the, here's the rule about transparency. Right. Any, the, the more a company in Silicon Valley talks about transparency, i.e. Google, the less transparent they are. Transparency actually <laughs> equals okay. a pass, a, opaqueness. Is but so, so, but let's, let's give, so let's give Syriac, so I agree with you. Let's, let's stipulate for a second, Andrew, that transparency is a Silicon Valley fetish, and there are many fetishes in Silicon Valley right now. Uh, but let's just, let's just give Syriac a chance to describe his version of transparency and what it actually means to him. So I think that um, there, there is a conversation here about, um, uh, about what is right. And we're basically talking about values here, morals, right? What's right and what's wrong? You ask for the red line. Where's the line? The line is a societal decision, really. Uh, any rules that we think are rules that we grew up with are very different from the rules that, that exist today. Uh, you can look at things outside of technology. Gay marriage used to be something that maybe 10% of Americans could imagine um, 40 years ago. 
and now it's 55 or 60 percent. So morals change, they shift. What, what used to be something that nobody could imagine is now suddenly common. With the millennials, uh, it is the same thing with regards to data. I think we should be cognizant of the fact that opinions change about what, mean, what it means to be in control and what it means to be um, uh, giving up things for, uh, about yourself in, 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 um, in return for something that you're getting back, some, some form of value. But let's really if try it to concretize it. If it's not what you're getting it? back, then there's a problem. But if you know what is coming back, then I think it's much less of an issue. In fact, I think people should be able to choose what they want. And I do not believe with the fundamental uh, stipulation that people don't know what they're doing. I think they will find out, even if they don't know right now, something's going to happen with one, one thing's going to blow up, and then everyone's going to watch that. For example, nobody knew what was going on with the NSA until, um, what, uh, one year ago? One year ago, well, we that's didn't not know true. That. Everybody knew so, what was going on with the NSA. Well, we didn't know the extent of it. I think most people did. <laughs> I don't know. I think so, anyone who's paying attention knew. And now, we... over time, things have become very clear, and now we sort of know what's going on. So now All it's right. a completely different debate. But let's. I'm very hungry for a concrete example in the commercial realm. Is it is it a dashboard where I know my data? Is that transparency? What is what is meaningful transparency when it comes to my personal data? What's a meaningful, what does it look like as a product? Meaningful transparency is one sentence when you sign up for Shopkick. Uh, the answer, uh, th there's a clear statement, your data doesn't go to any retailers, period. Your individual data doesn't go there, period. Unless you choose to and click on something else where you say, I want that, it will not happen. Got it. That's right. it. So that's the promise. David, go, we're going to go to, to David now. He's been waiting. It's a great discussion, and I, I'm going to broaden it in a way that many will not be surprised. You know, when I started this conference with the data from Gapminder, I'm not fucking around. I mean, I really think that's a very serious factor in the whole picture here. And when we say, is the Internet for against you? Who is the you? You know, the reality is no, the Internet is increasingly you said, you said in the, the billions. Data from Gapminder? What's, what's that? that? Oh, you weren't there. You weren't I was there, it's, so. it's <laughs> basically saying that this planet is more than, you know, the United States. States, and that increasingly the oh, global the, economy the includes at our yeah. level a larger and larger quantity yeah. of the human race, yeah. and that is a significant ba baseline fact that all these discussions have yeah. to factor in. And this one hasn't been factoring it in, in my opinion, although I don't think it's particular negative, but I want to just throw it out because I, it goes along with the point I made before about, you know, Keen uh, buying his, you know, access to Google by giving him this data. You know, it's all a matter of pursuit perceived benefit and perceived risk. And in the global in the global context, one of the things that the companies like Facebook have discovered unequivocally is that in Indonesia, privacy is not an issue at all. Because the people coming onto Facebook on their Blackberries in Indonesia never even had a phone before. They were living in a village. They didn't have anything. They get so much benefit from the internet at the, at the big picture level that these issues are trivial to them. And I, I'm, I'm not saying that will remain the case, but I think it's important to note that you know the internet, if that's what we're talking about, is it for or against you? It is, then the reason I am so convinced that it is Definitely for the Indonesians, in your view. Well, and that is the majority of people on the internet today and increasingly will be, so that's mine. Great. Well, well David, how many people well, arguing the internet is really against you? I mean, except for Andrew, maybe. You, how often do you hear that? <laughs> I think, you know, Jenny Moritzov has been getting extraordinary traction rate recently in every possible venue. Um, and I think he, it's I think it's healthy to have the Andrews and the Moritzovs, much as I find certain things they say really obnoxious and objectionable, not you. Know, but, you know, I, I think I think Moritzov is fundamentally naive and, and, and really uh, ahistorical and all kinds of things. But. I think there is a very, and look at the book, look at the Dave Eggers book. This is a massive new sudden, oh, I think yeah. there's a very yeah. big yeah. meme that so, the internet so is against just, you right that. now, Dave and Eggers, I don't dispute its validity. Yeah. I think Dave Eggers' book is a very valuable Just, just tell us about that book, just so everyone knows that book. Well, that's, it's what's a, it it's called? a novel the, that's about, called, yeah. takes place at like a Pinterest, the Google. The Circle, yeah, it's know, basically a, a novel written by one of the world's, you know, mo most leading novelists, and American novelist, called The Circle, about a fictional company that's like a hybrid of Google and Facebook that basically encourages everyone to be completely transparent, you know, to the level of video of everything they do, in fact, and that's the direction that the novelist fears, and it's like written in a very 1984-esque manner. So I don't know, I, I just think that, yes, people are getting worried. I don't think it's going to matter much. But you think this is much. the same old fear-mongering crap? That's what you think? Say it again. You think this is the same old fear-mongering bogus stuff? 
No, I don't think that. I think, I think though you have to look at which community you're talking about, and I think for a large number of people, the benefits they're getting today from the internet are so huge that these issues of privacy and such are trivial to them. I do think we can project ourselves into a world in five, 10 years, particularly if there are two or three or, or one company, you know, the, the Circle Company or Google or Amazon in particular or Facebook, that have so much data and that are fundamentally unregulated that 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 is a scary potential scenario to do me. You, do you, do you and I will the say same one thing, thing about the Chinese as you do about the Indonesians. The Chinese, right, is a huge growth in the internet. The access to the internet is of ma massive value, but they also have surrendered their privacy to the government, and the government has not allowed them their privacy. Is that? Do you also think it's trivial for the largest internet market in the world, the one you're accusing us of ignoring? You're accusing us of ignoring um, the rest the of the I think the average world. Chinese person is not hugely either surprised or concerned at the moment. I think they're, you know, no. but anyway, that's a whole but, different discussion. But very easily dismissed by you, right? You said that the Indonesians I'm not dismissing. are... I actually think that, you know, I always said about Zuckerberg that the biggest risk is regulation, and he didn't take it seriously enough. I've always said that. I said that at Facebook's office in front of 400 Facebook employees three years ago. And, you know, he has taken it more seriously since then. But he still doesn't okay, take let's, it seriously. Let's, let's not make this another Facebook effect. Over there. Yeah. I wish you were a shareholder because two at least you thoughts. get paid back for all the stuff. Jody Westby again. Two quick yeah. thoughts. One that I neglected to mention is a huge driver for company awareness and consumer awareness is cybercrime. Because it's the criminal that's winning and it's the criminal that's driving the regulators. And so uh, a lot of the privacy breaches aren't the bad companies. It's because the bad guys are getting the data. The, so the cyber criminals the, are actually for you. They're, they're, raising, this, well, they're raising awareness <laughs> that will get you protection. First, right. The second is a little bit of information will equal a lot of information. So the consumer, what you're going to see is down here. I think with the Snowden event, you're going to see this huge uh, uh, trajectory in public understanding of data mining. I'm... I'm so fed up with people saying, well, I don't have anything to hide. I don't care. But that's because they that's don't understand line, data mining. Yeah. And when they understand data mining, they're going to understand that this, quote, unquote, metadata that NSA nicely wrapped around this prote legally protected information, this huh. metadata, is actually something that's highly useful. And, and so a little bit of data people are going to understand equals identifiable data. And so that learning curve, when the public starts to understand the power of big data, companies that are stupid are going to be in trouble. James, Can I James are you, to... real quickly, James, and then Andrew. James, you, you, do, do you think that this Snowden moment or this moment, the zeitgeist, is actually stimulating consumer demand for protection of their data through regulation or technology? Or, is, or do people just not care? I mean, on the consumer side, it's a fair question. On the enterprise side, it's a definite yes, right? On the enterprise side, I mean, I think every single CIO or for the first time is thinking about security because in a different way, rather than trying to convince the CEO that they should pay attention, now the CEO is yelling at them and saying, hey, you know, sort of, have we done this and this and this, right? Mm -hmm. And I think like that, that shift is definite. And I think on the consumer side, these things take longer, right? I think we're going to see more vivid examples. And then I think, and then before you know it, like five years from now, like consumer sentiment will be different and the expectation of the change will be different. And does the enterprise the place where consumers get protected? So if you look at the kind of the big protections against fraud, I think Syriac pointed out towards fraud. Antivirus was another huge uh, uh, epidemic of the last couple decades on, on the internet, obviously. The enterprise took it upon itself basically to start locking down the threats. And that's where the technology and the innovation happened that ended up protecting end users around fraud and, um, uh, uh, and, and antivirus. I mean, to the extent that consumers get protected because of all this innovation that's happening in the enterprise is sort of a byproduct. And it won't be the companies that sell to the enterprise, right? There'll be some, there's going to be someone who's going to figure out a new way to sell to consumers and a new way to communicate this. And, and it, I mean, you know, it's just not going to be IBM. It's not going to be IBM. Andrew. So I, I want to respond to David because I think he, he, he's brought up the most important issue of all. And I think I, str I think I strongly disagree with him. He makes the point, he compares somehow America and Indonesia and say, well, Indonesians don't care because they're, I don't know, I've never been to Indonesia, but he's giving, he's, he's implying that somehow they all lived in villages. And now they've got this wonderful new shiny thing, their smartphone. And so for them, it's really not a big deal to give up privacy or data protection. And I think that, 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 that that's a kind of comment which one could suggest is extremely patronizing. And the reality 
of the next, you know, Ericsson does great research on this, the reality of the next 15, 20 years. It is, is the Indonesias of the world and, Africa's, uh, and the countries in Africa that are going to be coming online. And, and these people, I think, are much more vulnerable on the data front. And I think it's unacceptable to argue, well, they, they're really poor and they're really underprivileged, and so what's a little bit of data acquisition uh, for these people? I think it's a very, very dangerous thing to say. Uh, I gave a speech in Oslo to a group of uh, Africans when I was talking about this, and they were utterly horrified by this vision of the Internet of Transparency. They all told me that the, the essence of their societies was of privacy. So uh, I think this is, a huge, this is going to be an even bigger issue That's in the next 20 years. And I think you know, what Dwight's group is doing at Ericsson in terms of this digital society is really interesting. We have and to wrap. companies like Ericsson actually understand what's going on in the rest of the world. We have to wrap. 30 seconds for each of them, and then we'll say thank you. Very quickly, Dan, 30 seconds. Anything to wrap up comments? Um, I think the discussion has been very good. Um, I think we are at the, po at the junction point where government and regulation should come in. I think we have to be very careful about how we do that. Hmm. I think we should remember the comment from the beginning of the conference of my colleague James, who talked about the trillion dollar surplus that was created by the internet and keep that in mind. So this is where I agree with David. I was in Africa myself. I saw them looking at YouTube videos of how to take care of their kids. That's worth an enormous amount of money. It may be worth a lot uh, for many years, much more than the privacy issue. So I'm, I'm optimistic. Um, I think we should let uh, entrepreneurialism flourish. I'm not as worried about big companies. In every technological revolution, big companies started and eventually either by themselves, they broke apart, or governments helped break them apart. That's going to happen probably with those companies here as well. And I think there's enormous great, uh, great value that can occur through disruption by the usage of data and by the usage of the internet. Thank you. James, quickly, 30 seconds. I mean, the internet's, I mean, net, net, I think the internet is good for you, but it's also not your friend. And I think that we're, we are at the ah, very point interesting. where you know, we need to make a set of political decisions. And there are now interests aligned. You know, and there are people who are thinking about it in serious ways. And if you're out there right now, you should be getting involved on that policy side because these are the decisions that are going to last for 50 to 100 years. That's very interesting. Sirak, 30 seconds. I'm very excited about what's possible uh, that wasn't possible just a few years ago. I'm even more excited about what's coming, the Internet of Things, uh, the idea of sensors everywhere, the idea of the technology fading into the background. Uh, of um, even of faces becoming interfaces and gestures and so on. So there's a lot of great things. At the same time, I think we have to uh, find a way to have a debate on two levels. One is on what is right, what's the golden rule. In other words, what do I want to happen to me and only that should happen to others. And secondly, about what kind of regulation is necessary to enforce that for people who have a slightly different moral compass that don't that don't understand that golden rule. And I think the combination of those two things will help it, but I'm very excited about it, and I don't want it to stop. In fact, I want it to move forward faster, mm. because it's wonderful, but it has to go along with morals and with, with the right regulation. Mm. Andrew, bring us home, 30 seconds. 30 seconds. Um, I think we need, the internet is the platform for 21st century life. If, if we're going to really humanize it, we need to teach it or force it to learn how to forget. Hmm. Very powerful. Thank you very much. Thanks for our host of this economy. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. That was good, wasn't it? It was. Good job.